This has really been such an outstanding opportunity for me. Um, I've been working with Bennett off and on since the late 90s, like around 98. But when I spoke to the president, uh, our new president, Dr. Fuse Hall, and they mentioned including a commission painting celebrating her inauguration in Bennett, I was uh, uh, astonished and overwhelmed and honored. The other incredible thing is that the commission painting, which is 30 by 40 inches, the original stays a part of the Bennett College collection. So now I can list Bennett College as one of my foremost collectors and the institutions that I'll always be involved with. This is my artist brother, <laughs> Harry Turfel. And we started working together last fall. And when I had a chance to do some classes with, with his people and do a lecture, and always know that my lectures are really never lectures, because to date, I think I tried to do a lecture with, with a, a notes or something. It didn't work. I just have to talk from my heart. And it just comes up, whatever comes up. And I feed from whoever's hearing what they want from me. Just like um, I had pleasure at Bessemer. Mark. Yes, yes. Uh, with the children there today. Uh, we had like, we were going to get it ready to show a video, but we had little tech stuff going on, so we couldn't do it right away. So we spoke for, what was it, half hour? I spoke for half hour to children and just fed off of what they wanted to know. And, and that's, that's how I like to work. So I'm just saying to you, welcome, and I can tell you just a little bit of, about myself and why this year is so important to me. It's my 45th anniversary as a professional artist. <laughs> And um, I, I, it, to me, it's unbelievable. But I actually sold my first painting when I was 20 in New York when I was an accountant uh, for a mortgage insurance company. I was a accounts receivable clerk. And what I would do on payday is go to a local close uh, Manhattan uh, art store that I found and buy some art supplies. So of course, all my coworkers saw me doing this. And one of the lawyers, uh, approached me and he said, would you do a painting for my apartment? And I was like, do it. somebody's going to pay me to do it. So I didn't even know what to charge. So I said, well, I'd love to do that. Uh, his name was Dan Fishman. And I said, I would love to do that. I said, but, you know, trusting him as a lawyer, I said, what should I charge you? And he said, well, the artists in the village are pretty much, remember this is 1969 are getting about $75 for an original. You have to understand that at that time, my partially furnished apartment in the Bronx, in a good area in the Bronx, was $125 a month. OK. <laughs> so you got to do relativity on that one. And $75 to do something that I enjoy doing, I couldn't believe it. So I, I created the painting, and uh, I took it to my office. And in doing so, I didn't do this on purpose. There was no other way to do this. But now I understand because I took it to my office and other people saw it, it's that bandwagon, you got one, I want one, I'll call it Fuller Brush Company, Avon, or Mary Kay. <laughs> it's sort of, and I didn't think of that. But sometimes if people see things, especially in an office situation where you're working, they say, oh, I want one too. So I bought the painting in. I was very nervous. He loved it. And fellow uh, workers loved it too. And they wanted to um, commission me to do work. Well, before they could, he, had, he commissioned me to do a, a second piece. And from there, to my supervisor, a coworker. And that's how I started selling my art in New York. So to me, that will always be incredible. With that $75, I bought art supplies, the first Polaroid camera, and my boyfriend a gift, and I had some change. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can just think about what, what things cost now. So uh, I'm going to just put out there, if my rent was $125 and say, and this is not what it is, say it's like $12.50 now, what, what would that painting have gone for if you multiply it by what is 10 or something? Yeah, so what, 750 or something like that? That's still not too bad. 
But for all these years, uh, that one of the young people asked me how much have I ever, the highest amount of money I ever made for a painting. And I explained to him, this doesn't happen often, hardly ever, but one time I was paid 20000 Yeah. And he was like, wow. And the next kid said, do you live in a mansion? I said, no, I'm just a regular person because I never know what I'm going to make or what's going to happen. Uh, but sometimes I'm fortunate and something big will happen. Uh, the, the other side of that coin is something I started thinking about in marketing uh, back in 92. I worked so much with nonprofits and then later with universities and colleges. I said, let me come up with a, a, something that could work for them, that could bring them money. They're, I'm always uh, donated limited edition prints and everything. Hi, Dr. Scott. Uh, she was the first, she was the president here the first time I came. Uh, and I said, well, you know, what can I do that's going to benefit us and benefit everyone? So I found a lesser amount of money scale that still benefited me to create an original painting and then uh, donated licensing to the nonprofit like YWCA of Greater Los Angeles, you know, 100 Black Men National, uh, now also Bennett College, and then they can use that image, and I'm not asking for any more money, on licensing, and continue to make money. So one of the things to kind of know about that is that in the prints that, that were, I was able to have reproduced for Bennett, they're a thousand. Uh, they're only selling them for $60. So they easily can make $60,000. From, from all of that being purchased. And because it's an open edition print, it can be printed again. And then it could be t-shirts, it can be backpacks, it can be all kinds of things. So that's a, a, another mission that's helping me as an artist. And I don't live in a mansion and I don't have to drive a big car. <laughs> but you know, young people kind of get mixed up with that. They just think just because you're doing this or maybe you've been on TV, then you've got money. So what I wanted to do, as I talked to Harry uh, earlier, is leave something here that the exhibits here closes at the end of October. But if I could just walk around and talk about each piece a little bit, then generations can come and hear or whatever. It'll be in their archives. To me, in my mind, sometimes I, I try to think about, since I've done such a, a, a number of nonprofit organization pieces and all kinds of things. I always try to make each and every one unique in some way that it really belongs to that college, institute, nonprofit, or whatever. Here, the most important thing to me was I wanted to put Dr. Fuse Hall here in it, but even on top of that, I wanted to create a bell. So that's the bell. So that's the Bennett Bell. Do you see that? Okay, see, like this is the top of the bell, and as you go down, that's the rest of the bell. So she's at the helm of the bell, where you would shake it, okay? Right, so I, I wanted to do that. Um, of course, I wanted to put the pearls, because that's very much Bennett. Alumni, alum okay, definitely. The first four graduates from Bennett, and then in the 1930s, I had fun doing these hats. I especially liked her hat. You know, the women that are looking on to the graduates. Of course, Bennett Bells, uh, fresh women or women that are going to come in and become Bennett Bells. Um, basically, this, these colors are all acrylic. This color, this really bright yellow, is for enlightenment or knowledge. So that's dealing with knowledge and learning from uh, Bennett College. Um, the white has to do with the beard and gate and some of the ceremonies that are done all in white. And yeah, that's pretty much it. And, and some seven to nine coats of paint in each area. So that's this piece. Any questions? Oh, okay. So I don't, I, don't, I don't want to keep you here all night, so I'm not going to, this is the longest time I'm going to explain something and that's the, you know, but I'll give you more. So here, I had done a series on Haiti, and this is called Les Enfants or the Children, and I've been working with a, a, a child of Haiti, which I was bringing money into Haiti 
uh, foreign orphanages. So this is all my children of Haiti, so it's basically all the children. The original painting is about, mm, about this big. So when I do these reproduction G clays on canvas, what I love about it is they look like originals. So you don't have to have that original budget to have something in your home that looks like an original. So this is Les Enfants. Uh, this original painting is three by four feet. I uh, was commissioned by uh, Sisters of Providence, which is uh, missionaries that began in the 1860s out of Canada. And they ended up all over the world with uh, missions, including like Chile, the Cameroons, uh, El Salvador, uh, the Philippines, Alaska. See, they went first to Seattle and they were in Canada and Haiti and, and they also in Africa, the other areas in Africa. So all of these years, if you're like in the Los Angeles um, area or Canada or whatever, we have a lot of hospitals or, or Providence hospitals. So they're responsible for that. And, um, and they, were, they were rugged women that actually built the cabins and took care of people on their own. That's why I made them a rugged kind of color, a little peach color, because they were in the sun building cabins and things and taking care of people. Uh, and after a while, they stopped wearing habits and they started using the pen. It's the P with the cross for Sisters of Providence. You see this here? So she's actually a nun, but she's just wearing a pen. Um, the most incredible thing that's ever happened to me as far as an auction goes, uh, a piece this size, not even a G clay on canvas, but it was a print that I had drawn a little bit on the side and I did 10 of those for them. We were raising money for Chile and we were in Seattle and, and, and uh, Chile, there had been an earthquake, there had been a fire and they had to rebuild a lot. So that one print that would have sold for at the most $1,200 Guess how much it went for an auction? Anybody? How much? Oh, you're good. No, it's 50,000. <laughs> that was good, I wish it. But what they did is they sold the other nine. So the total was 272,000 that went to Chile. Right, and now I was just sitting on the stage and I know my mouth is like, <laughs> And I wasn't getting any money from it. That wasn't the point. It was sort of like, wow, something I created could actually generate that much money to aid a mission and people in a country. What year was that? That was about four or five years ago. And I was just, I was just amazed. You know, um, I'm looking for that to happen for someplace else. I did something before. But in reality, I just went like, wow. Even if it was the original painting to sell for $50,000, but this was a piece of, on paper, it wasn't even on, on canvas. So, okay, so Sisters of Providence. Uh, I have a friend that, who is he? He's one of those guys that belong to what fraternity? <laughs> so what I did, um, I've known him since junior high school, and he decided after all these years he was gonna write a book about the, about the brothers and what they did and the money that they wanted to do, but it was fiction but it's an incredible book about what could happen if everybody got together and, and really wanted to give. So I created this piece, and this is uh, one of the wives. So this is a son, father, grandfather, wife, and you know, the women are called the silhouettes. So the kappas, right. Um, I did something for National Education Association, okay, um, out of DC for one of their conferences. And they wanted me to just show um, multicultural, everybody's involved. And a simplistic way that I did the fact that this teacher is disabled, that you can slightly see a chair that she's sitting in and the children are surrounding her. Uh, so it's just all kinds of people, all walks of life. And of course this painting is a bit bigger too. But the poster that they gave out that national conference was about this size on paper generating that for the educators. This is part one. On the other side, you'll see the other side of the diptych. This is the first painting I started on the Haiti series. And so I found a piece on the market. So this is one of the tap taps. And this is, says the pearl. And then it's of the Antilles. So when, the, when you see the both together, you'd see the other side and the kids. But I fell in love with these big hats. 
And that intrigued me. And I said, oh, I think I want to do that. And then since this one, I did 15 paintings on Haiti. Mardi Gras. OK. The original is three by four feet. It was a commission by a friend of mine, Mary Bond Davis, who's really been a Broadway um, singer, actor, and things like Jelly's Last Jam and um, Hairspray she starred in and things like that all her life. And she moved back to California to care for her mother out of New York and opened a clinic to do something. And she asked me to do a piece for her. So what I loved about it is that she said, do whatever you want to do, Cynthia. So I talked to one of our mutual friends, both fr best friends for both of us, and he told me she fell in love with New Orleans. So I painted her front line doing the Mardi Gras. So she's leading the parade. So this is Mary Bond Davis. <laughs> And these feathers, that's all was done in oil. That's why you see the texture. The rest, again, these are seven to nine. For instance, this color is about nine or 10 coats of this color. Depends on the color. Um, Can you talk about how you choose color? I think that's such a striking thing because you have this big field of orange. Well, you know what? There, it's like this. I love color. So I never plan it. Um, what I do is I take a non-photo blue pencil and, and like I started with her, looked at a bunch of photographs and stuff, kind of did an outline of how I wanted her to feel like I knew she was moving and dancing and, and filled in the face and not this but knew this, that's where feathers are going to go. And then I just do the first coats of paint on this and I, then I start going like, oh, who should I add? Then I start adding this person. I may have not started there, I may have started with him. I may have gone here. I don't remember exactly how I did it. These are the black Indians of New Orleans, so he has that whole other design happening. And then once I get the coat, because I have like, usually most of these paintings have about 25 different colors in it. And they're straight out of an acrylic Liquitex little bottle. It's not a tube, it's a little bottle. I stick the brush straight in there. And I just go, and then when I finally get to the point where there's the first coat of paint down, it's really pretty much done except for the repetition. So sometimes I take the bottles and they're over here and I might put them over here as I finish. Like, I did that one, I did that one, I did that one. Then I go, okay, let me do that one, let me do, you know. But when it came to the oil, that would have happened towards the end because that would have really messed with and mingled into things because this is a whole nother process. And it's real wet and it takes much longer to dry. So, yeah. So I really, I don't even know. I know what my favorite colors are, and I, I know what hits me. <sighs> okay, uh, this one, that one. Uh, let me see, uh, this one, that one. No, it goes on and on. So <laughs> but they're always bright. They're the bright colors. You know, and that, I, I said, that's why I said in one interview, I'm like a kid in a candy store. And the one time I had to paint something and it wasn't bright is because I did something for the play Miss Evers Boys. So that was really sad. And so the body posture, everything was like this. There was a little bit of color, but it's, it's a sad story, that the whole truth about all that. So that's one time I had to not be bright and it wasn't uplifted. But other than that, it's always going to be bright. Sometimes I just put on music so I can just feel this little thing. Like what I did at Zydeco, I played a lot of Zydeco music while I was painting that. And, and looked at Zydeco videos to see the people dancing. Yeah, but I like, I like happy stuff, but I do have to do other stuff at times. Yeah. Right, do that. I would love that. I would love that. <laughs> that would work. That would work. Because I still think I have something else to do with that, you know, because Zydeco is the second one. Basically, what is a nonprofit organization that teaches children in the South Central area to play classical music, classical instruments, and Maestro, he, is, um, he teaches at the college in Berkeley, he's a conductor for a couple of symphonies, and he works with them. Um, his background is Samoyan, I believe, in J J Jamaican, and uh, he's like the soonest he plays a lot of instruments and whatever. And I did a fundraiser at home for them, and this was like the painting I did celebrating their organization. Yeah, so maestro. How 
It's good to see a nice, see a black maestro. Um, why is it that on this painting I can see like brushstrokes? Because it's an original. Oh, oh. <laughs> this one's an original. So if you get close, you can see the texture in his hair. You can see his lapel. You can even see his white tie on top of the mm -hmm. white shirt. Oh, so that's what There's only saying. two originals here. Okay, so that's what you're saying is the difference between how some of these are like larger scale, but like how do you get the original that's at your house and turn it into one of these other? G. Clay? Uh, a very um, high grade of photography. That's, they, they're, they're called TIFFs and JPEGs. And they could actually make it three or four times bigger if need be, or they can make it smaller. But it's such a high grade reproduction or photographic process that that can be done. So I do, I have sold him in different sizes, you know, but this is the original. I wanted to have at least two originals here so you could see what an original looks like. The, um, the other my seascape, the other side. yeah, my seascape, <laughs> yeah, right. This is Zydeco, so you see that, you know, they're doing their little dance and, you know, if you know Zydeco music, I have my little board thing here, you know, my accordion, the guitar, and I love this couple. I think they, they were, I started, how did I start? I, th I think I started with these two guys. And then I kind of began putting some colors down, because I'm always in a rush to go color. I couldn't draw this whole thing. I couldn't be that patient and not have any color. I said, oh, no, I can't wait that long. So I've got to go and put some color in there. And uh, just look at, you know how we look when we're dancing. We look like we're, like, malformed. Because <laughs> what your body does when you're dancing is nothing like what we would normally look like if we were just standing. So with this one, I did uh, get some Zydeco music and listened to it and, and felt it. I was, uh, I've done two Tom Joyner cruises to raise funds for historically black universities and college, colleges and universities. And on one, um, it was one year, I can't remember, was it 09? I think it was 09. And everybody was ready to go to the Mexican Riviera, but there was some kind of disease or some kind of flu going on. So all of these black people were on this ship, almost a city worth almost 3,000. <laughs> We couldn't go to, to Mexico or anything. So it started in Los Angeles, one of the only times it's done that. And it actually just went up to San Francisco, you know, and then it went up to uh, Victoria, British Columbia. And in Victoria, British Columbia, there's something called Butterfly Gardens, where you go in and there's butterflies from all over the world, sometimes cocoons that have actually become butterflies there. And, and you're just walking around, and they're just flying around. There's flamingos there, uh, incredible, and foliage, and you're just like in this little paradise. The hardest part is to know that if a butterfly lands on you, don't hit it. It's okay. You know, because it's sort of like, and they kind of warn you, because that's kind of like saying, they're really saying, I like you, I, feel, I trust you if they're going to land on you. One landed on me for a while, I was just walking around. I was like, okay, I got a butterfly. But anyway... This is a tail jay. A tail jay is actually a butterfly from Southeast Asia. And I loved it. It was a black butterfly, all these lime green spots. The original is two by, uh, two, by two feet. So this is about half the size. Of course, the butterfly is not that big. But I wanted to do it bigger. And I painted all the way around the original. And I said, look at those markings. And sometimes what happens to me, I get so carried away and excited with what I'm doing, I don't know how much work I'm giving myself. Lime green is about 10 coats of paint. <laughs> but just thinking about doing a black and trying to make it as much as to look like that butterfly. I did a few, and I'll, when I was there, I took photographs of the butterflies, and I went home and researched them. But I based a lot on my photographs. Uh, the other one that I really liked, the second one was a zebra butterfly. That's on my website. Yeah, the zebra butterfly is just black and white. It's from uh, South America and areas like that. But this one is from Southeast Asia. This is um, another Haitian piece called Le Carnival. And this is probably 40, it's the same size as the Bennett piece, the original is. When I started this one, I looked at a lot of things, including videos. And I said, I think I better start with the stilt dancer because that would give me the idea of how to gauge other people's heights and how the people way back here coming towards us, how they would look and how the onlookers would look 
of the rah-rah is one of their uh, religious uh, spiritual things like the Yoruba. So these are like handmade instruments. And these women with the scarves are rah-rah. They're in that spirit of dancers. So they're here and so I have to figure out what's happening between here because this one's here and that one's over there. So you look at her scarf is here but it has to also show up there. There's all these little intricate things you've got to figure out if you're going to do a mass of people. And uh, once I got him down, I was cool. Because <laughs> then I could do it. And figuring out these handmade instruments. So that's the carnival. This is first family. Um, that was after the second um, term of office for Obama. So I just painted him and Michelle and the girls in the center. And then I dealt with people from all countries, you know, like Palestine, Israel, Pakistan, um, Europe, or really London, Spain, Africa, you know, and just kind of put them all together. And I also did this in the first painting I did about him becoming president because it's the only time that I know in my history that the whole world celebrated uh, an American president. So no matter who likes him or doesn't like him, <laughs> you know, the reality is the whole world celebrated him when he became a president. I don't, they didn't do that for the Kennedys. Okay, so this would. Do you ever put yourself in? Yeah, I, I show up in a few. I show up in a few. None of them that are here. I once did something for Harlem Book uh, uh, Fair, you know, and it, and it had, I said, okay, I'm doing this for Harlem, and it's in the streets um, kind of like 135th Street near Lenox in that area. So what I did is I painted all these people coming to the book fair. And then I had on this side and that side, I had, you know, authors signing their books. And then the last author on this side was me. It's called Uptown. And the last author in the book, uh, I'm sorry, was me here. And I gave myself a line of people waiting for me to sign their books to infinity. <laughs> but unless I told you it was me, you wouldn't really know. Right. I had all people, all my books, they were just, you know, so I had fun doing that. Was painting a painting for Nelson Mandela's Lifetime Achievement Award from Africare. And he actually, I still own the original, so he didn't receive the original, but he uh, received a G clay on canvas this size, but ornately framed in Lifetime Achievement Award and all that stuff there. And his uh, daughter and grandson received it in DC at a wonderful event. Um, uh, for Africare, so it was his Lifetime Achievement Award. So this award is, in, of course, in South Africa because he has a gallery of all the things that have come to him over the years there. For so, the piece that you did for Mandela, would you have signed that differently um, from <coughs> your original? Or would there have been anything well, I think particular marking which would distinguish it from other? No, they're just, they're just still the number. But the thing was that the way that they signed it, how it was pre presented to him, was that it was framed, you know, and it had a plaque and everything saying Lifetime Nelson Mandela or whatever, Lifetime Achievement Award from Africa. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so that would be it. And um, even, if you, um, even if you Googled that, you'd find it because uh, when he passed, they, they did that. They started showing that whole thing about that ceremony. And they keep shooting back to it occasionally, that piece. So that was like a really huge honor. I mean, that wasn't even about any kind of money. They could have said, okay, Cynthia, we only got a dime, but can you do this? And there's no way I wouldn't have done it, you know. And Africare is a nonprofit organization. So they didn't have the funds to bring me in. I used my frequent flower miles. I used my Marriott rewards for where I stayed, you know, and I was definitely there. So if you go online, you'll also see me with his daughter and, and son at that ceremony. All right. Okay, so this is only half. You guys have any more energy? You want to hear any more? Nah? Okay, all right. They say, come on down. This is also part of my Haitian series. It's Chow Chow Beach. Yeah, and this is actually Chow Chow Bay Beach in, in um, Haiti. Or some people would say, Haiti. Um, and what I, I found this beach, and, and because of all of what, for so many years, about Haiti, it's, all, it's been a lot of sad news. There's always sad news. So uh, we lost, 
any idea that it was a, that's a beautiful place and the good things and whatever. So I started researching things and uh, I've never been there. Um, I, my grandfather, who I never knew, was Haitian. Um, and so I guess it was part of what I felt I wanted to do and needed to do. So the reason why I started the series. So I, I just went and looked at this beautiful beach, which is like a bay beach. And if you look at any of my seascapes, especially if you go online, they're usually straight across. This was a bay, so it was coming in. So I said, oh, this is fun. How am I going to do all these little strokes? So this is all oil. That's all oil. And everything you see is tiny little strokes. OK? Just a, a couple of paints together to make a color, and then a 0-3 brush to do like little tiny strokes to all of that there. OK? And then I decided my children, now, this and this actually takes less time for me to do than the eight coats of paint on these children. But it looks so intricate, and it is, but it's a one-time application. Yeah, because you're, you're blending and you're creating stuff using paints that are wet. So Chow Chow Beach, and that's about twice as big. This was uh, three by four feet. I thought it was important to have here because this is the painting that changed my style when I started creating people featureless. Now, you hardly see any of them from the front. This is in Martinique. Bellefontaine is a fisherman's village in Martinique, and I was there in 84, 85. So if you look real close, you'll see little kids peeking out because their father's coming home from fishing the day in the boats. You'll see like little tiny bit, but this was really like the beginning of me creating people and painting them featureless. So I used to do in, uh, paintings of people and children and wild domestic animals realistically were, were that if you looked at the painting and you were in that room, wherever you were, you look at that painting and that monkey or lion or tiger or whatever would look right back at you. Or if it was a per person, they would look at you. And I'd have to say that the funniest thing to think about that is that I, many years ago in the early 70s or something or mid 70s, I gave my mother my only ever oil uh, self-portrait. And um, in the portrait, I'm not smiling. But everywhere she went, you know, she could look at me. So she finally called me up and she said, Cynthia, are you mad with me? Everywhere I go, you're looking at me and you're not smiling. <laughs> so I suggested she give it to one of my brothers. I don't know, this was so many years ago. But that was the effect that that really, that. So I would always say in my little one-bed apartment, if anybody uh, broke in to try to steal something, they would leave. Monkeys and tigers and bears are looking at you and looking at you. So I learned to do it. So it's not that I don't know how to do it. It's, uh, but this is how my style developed. This is 85. Yeah. And it's three by four. So that's how most of my seascapes look. It's the same technique of all those little tiny strokes. But I just love doing something different with that bay, like it's like being circular or coming in. So this is from a trip that I took to Aruba and came back and wanted to do something. I've done a few things on Aruba, but this is one of the ones that stands out for me. Colorful buildings and all that. Oh, and then I drove myself crazy. I had to keep doing these little, because doesn't that look like somebody cut out little white strips or something? No, that's about six coats of paint. I'm going like. Oh, I'm so glad I don't drink coffee anymore. <laughs> this one is, is bigger also. It's 24 by 24. But I wanted to do something celebrating Juneteenth. Right? <laughs> so I got my banjo man right there. I've got, if you look at it closely, you see like just colors here and that color and that color. Those are umbrellas. So these are vendors to either side. So you see the people looking from side to side or coming this way or going this way. And these are all the children dancing to the banjo man. You see the Texas flag. Yes, yes, see? Even in her, even in her earring. Yeah. By the way, Dr. Scott is from Corpus Christi, Texas. <laughs> so I'm going to do something with her for her Juneteenth celebration. She's going to use this for something coming up. We celebrate 10 days of Juneteenth every year. Yeah. The 9th to the 19th. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And here's another Haitian. It's a, a more of a cleansing ceremony. It's called Healing Waters Haiti. So the women are, are all 
dressed in white and they go into the water for sort of similar to a baptismal, but it's more of a cleansing. There's not no one there to baptize them, it's their own ritual. And a lot of this is based on the Yoruba religion, of course, so it's the African religion. So um, healing water is Haiti, yeah. This one hangs behind, over my head when I'm sleeping. So kind of like it's healing me whenever I go to sleep when I'm home, so, okay, heal me, heal me. So I can get up and work again, okay, heal me. <laughs> and we got just a little bit more. This is the piece I did when, uh, how you doing? When o Obama first became president. And uh, uh, I'm adopted into so many families, so I have a, uh, also have a Chinese mother. And um, she sent me this, fire rainbow, because these, these kind of things do happen in, I think it's the Midwest, I can't remember what states. I have to go back and look. These things actually happen. Most of them are more like spitfires. We have our kind of rainbows, and there's certain states that have a whole other kind of rainbows. And she found this rainbow, because this is based on a real rainbow. And she emailed it to me, and I kept it for future whenever I would use it. And when um, Obama became president, I said, oh, I'm going to use that. That's going to be the symbol of the hope of the future and things that can happen. This over the rainbow, you know, everything from religious to leprechauns to gold or whatever. And then after that, after I had finished the painting and it had been out for a while, then I realized, oh, he's a fire sign too. So then, you know, so even that made sense. This is the water symbolizing the, actually the whole world, our whole world. So these are people from all over the world. Uh, we start with his father and mother. Then I did things on purpose, like put Israel and Palestine together. Let's get together. Enough of this stuff. You know, and then I, my intention, oh, this is his, his grandmother. My intention was absolutely for him not to be in it at all. Because I just like to do things differently. I don't want to, I don't ever capitalize on what's going on. And I'm not putting down any artists for doing it. It's just not, I don't like to do what everybody's doing. And sure enough, he showed up here with her and I didn't even intend it. So he just moved himself all up in there. And uh, this is his, so then at this point, this is his uh, stepsister, stepfather, and this is his sister when she was little and big. And then I uh, unveiled this at a museum in Los Angeles, a Black Firefighters Museum in Los Angeles. and. This lady in the audience has said, she says, yes, and that's the grandmother and her two girls. Was not my intention, the grandmother and the two girls. <laughs> and that just happened that way. You know, so sometimes, Your was really like yes, yeah. So then, of course, you got all the countries and places all over here, too. Uh, so that was celebrating hope. So fire rainbow Obama. This is the an original seascape, so as a, which one? This is a daybreak. So what I do at home, I usually walk the beach in the morning when the sun's first coming up, or just before. So this is some inspiration from seeing water. And this is all oil, no same little stroke, except there's no people and there's no figures. So if you look close, you just see more strokes and very thick oil so you can feel the waves, my kind of waves, you know, that the water is moving. And the 03 brush is really tiny, so that's what I do the white little paint on top of the, the little areas. So this kind of painting kind of shows that I'm crazy. Because I go like, <laughs> and it relaxes me. <laughs> and then if that's not enough, it's painted all around the side too, right? <laughs> and on the bottom and on the top. Uh, this is the new series I've been working on, uh, Curacao. For my 65th birthday, I saved up enough money and enough frequent flyer miles to go to Curacao for four days. And I walked all over the place and did things. I fell in love with these little houses that looked like they should be at Disneyland or something. They don't even look real, you know? But uh, I had fun with this balcony because even with just the color here, would, would it change to make that feel like a balcony? Because this would look more like shading or something. But it was just really intriguing to me, and like the, some of the window designs, and and then I added my people, and um, and this area of Curacao 
is across a bridge. On this side of the bridge is where there's things like I've done the floating market, and I've also done other areas in that area that's on this side. And on the other side of the bridge is other things happen there. Uh, on this side of the bridge, you can, it's actually between that, you can, the big cruise ships come in between, and they have that uh, thing where they actually, they, that bridge actually goes up and over for uh, this yacht or whatever to come through. And it comes back down for people to cross. It's amazing to me. One person told me, that a friend of mine said, I wouldn't walk across that bridge. Because, you know, it moves. Yeah. Well, it gets down. It's okay. Yeah, so that's uh, one of my favorites with the people. And these are like shoppers from the floating market. Um, and on the other side is more the produce. There's different areas. Some of these are workers. Some of the people are going to school you know, with their, their grandmother, parent, and tourists. One of, the, one of the women on the island. You know, I just make up people in my mind from the people I've seen there. And so that's um, the second piece, I believe, I did on Curacao. And that's on my little card, right? My little business card, you know, that I gave you? Yeah. So on this side, you can see the other side of the tap tap. It says the Antilles. So the other one is the Pearl of the Antilles, was what the island was called. And I had a little girl on this side, and these women communicating with these women on this side. This old saying, um, there's a wonderful writer that I love, and Lisa C is her name. She's done so many books um, on China and some of her heritage, and um, in, including uh, the Chinese in California and how her family migrated to California and, and made money and did what they did. But she really delved into this thing that I loved about two little young girls in China and different villages that became like, the best old saying was similar to God sisters or something. So two different families, but the difference is they had to have so many things similar because there was a matchmaker. So they had to have the same amount of brothers, the same amount of this, it was like really technical, the same age. And they only see each other maybe once or twice a year. So it's called Something in a Secret Fan, Snowflower in a Secret Fan. It's also made into a film, so you could find the film. And what it's about is about what they went through as children, having to not be in the sun, to stay as pale as possible, and all that foot binding to have the small, small feet and whatever. So one of the things that really hit me in this, because they're teenagers at this point, is that they would look out the window and one of the young girls would be so intrigued by a butterfly because the butterfly had freedom to fly and, and do whatever. So I decided to connect them with this butterfly. And then in each of their little umbrellas, they have a little butterfly because that's what they'd rather have been doing. But, it, but the book does, it chronicles their lives from like little babies, little three years old, up until um, in their 50s or 60s. It's an incredible film too. But uh, yeah, she's done about five incredible books. So Lisa C. is one of my authors. So this is like when I was telling some of the students, sometimes it comes from a book I read. Mm -hmm. So this is what this one comes from. And do we have one more, I think? Yeah, one more. One more. What, I, what I do is I try to, at least every five years or so, give myself a birthday gift, a big one. So for my 60th birthday, I went to the Turks and Caicos. <laughs> Same thing, freaking flower miles, da, da, da. And, and I decided a Turks and Caicos sunset and made a romantic scene. It's so pretty with the white sand beaches. And this ended up being, when I first came back from the Turks and Caicos, someone uh, actually commissioned me to do a painting for them. I painted this, so it's 24 by 36 is the painting. And then I uh, reproduced it. So I actually got a chance to come back from the Turks and Caicos and get commissioned to do a painting from the Turks and Caicos, that, I don't, that's never happened. And so this is the Turks and Caicos. And so this is the, would be the oil, the oil with the trees, a little bit in the sky, and the sunset. So any questions? No? Okay, doesn't that make a lot of difference to know where all this came from? <laughs> it, makes, it makes so much difference to me because when I go back and I think about it, which I never usually get a chance to do, unless I'm explaining it to somebody, it's like, wow, that's where that came from. You know, they didn't just pop up out of nowhere. 
So they all have very deep meanings for me. That's why they're all my babies. You know, I birthed them all, seriously. And went to bed with the sore arm to prove it. <laughs> so thank you so very much for coming. Yeah, okay. And, and this exhibit will be up till the end of October if there's anyone that you'd like to invite to come and see. And always remember that if there's anybody that you know that may be interested in purchasing anything, that 40% goes into a Bennett Endowment. Right. This is not all going here. It's going to <laughs> it's A lot of it has to do with Bennett. All right? OK, thank you. Thank you for coming. Did you like the paintings? Great. Are you an artist? Uh, not really, but sometimes I do. OK, well, then, if you do it sometimes, I'm sorry, I'm concerned you're an artist. OK, I'm so glad you came. I thought it would be just a wonderful idea for this would be in the Bennett College archive to have over 22 pieces of my work here and for me to actually take them on tour so that in the future anyone will be able to share the experience. Um, I thought that would be monumental and I'm so happy we did that today. Well, one of the other wonderful things that happened is I received the Bell Ringer Award, which I decided means that I'm an honorary Bell. So I will be coming back forever. All they have to do is give me a call, shoot me an email, and I will be here. I've also established a fine art scholarship fund that we're going to begin saving and, and raising money for so we can give scholarship to fine art students. <laughs>